think we're all put together here. So I still see that uh, there's a handful of people piling in. Um, we will start this webinar here shortly. Okay, uh, let's let's begin here. Um, my name is Brady O'Leary, and this webinar will be about clean water auction transfer testing. Uh, the title here is pretty pretty bog standard. Um, it's very factual, um, but uh, I will tell you that this content, or at least the experience of clean water auction transfer testing, is a heck of a lot more interesting than um, you know the name uh, implies. And to start here. A lot of times people try to build credibility in the presenter. They'll tell you that uh, he or she went to XYZ fancy school and graduated with honors and is a member of 5S, maybe has worked at the biggest wastewater treatment facilities in, in the country. Um, I'm not going to do that. Uh, that's old hat. Um, I'm going to do the uh, exact opposite. I'm going to tell you a story about a time where, where I screwed up where we screwed up and we learned a lot from it um mistakes were made i'll tell you about what we did what we learned and i guess this is all in hopes that you too can learn from our experiences um and it's a bit more interesting than <laughs> talking about accolades so before we get to that uh my name is brady o'leary um and let's have a kind of high level view look at what we're talking about here um, we're all here today to learn a bit more about aeration. And the EPA, uh, well, the US EPA, defines aeration not as just adding oxygen to water, but as adding oxygen to the water and then mixing it such that the oxygen uh, is always in contact with the waste. Um, so essentially, aeration is oxygenation and mixing. Uh, what we're here today to talk about is the oxygenation side of things. Uh, that's the underlined. Uh, line there in the EPA quote. And we need to figure out, or we're going to talk about, how to know how much oxygen we're imparting into the water. Um, we, we know that we're doing it. We know that we're putting bubbles into the water or a surface aerator is drafting air down into the water. But the question is, how much? And we evaluate that uh, with a process called clean water OTE testing or clean water oxygen transfer testing. Uh, and the idea is we want to isolate the aerator in uh, all the aerator's performance. A wastewater facility has all sorts of variables. Um, the, at least if you have a diffused aerator, you might have a blower on shore. Uh, the water is very dirty, uh, has a lot of BOD or could have surfactants that impact the aerator. Um, there's a lot of surface area. The bottom might be on level. And there's aerators all around it. How do you isolate the performance of one aerator to know exactly what this one device is doing. And that's the purpose of OTE testing. It's where to take that one device specifically and test it for its maximum performance. Um, and what we're going to establish is the rate of transfer in clean water. So we're not doing it in wastewater, there's no surfactants. This is essentially potable water that you get out of your tap. It does have a little bit of stuff in it, it has chlorine, but that off gases pretty quickly. For all intents and purposes, we're testing it in clean water. Uh, and the idea there is if we can know what it does, what performance we can achieve in clean water, we can put it into various types of wastewater and adjust the clean water performance to that type of wastewater. So we can essentially derate performance. But the benefit of clean water is clean water in Chicago, Illinois, and clean water in California are relatively the same. So we're creating a similar baseline for performance. Um, another thing that the clean water OTE testing does, or at least attempts to do, is utilize the same testing methodology. If you have somebody, again, in California testing and somebody in Chicago, you want them to be using the same steps and the same methods to make sure that the results produced in either uh, area are comparable. Um, and lastly, clean water OTE testing, uh, in it, there are a lot of variables that need to be normalized or standardized. 
Uh, and that's a bit detailed, but we'll get into that in a little bit. So I told you I was going to tell you a story. So here we go. This um, is an aerator that we used to sell triple point 10 years ago, 2009. Uh, we were a young company. We were moving from stormwater detention, aeration and cleaning, essentially backyard ponds to the aeration of wastewater facilities. And the, the device was the same and this was it. Um, if you have been around Triple Point at all, uh, the concept here will look pretty familiar. Uh, we have a coarse bubble static tube in the center, and we have a series of eight fine bubble discs on the outside. Uh, we were a small company at the time. Uh, we were actually getting these discs out of USA Blue Book um, because we didn't have uh, any kind of scale or relationships with large uh, suppliers. As a matter of fact, I think these are uh, membranes from what is now somewhat of a competitor to ours, but you know, we had to use what uh, we had to use what we had or uh, had available to us back then. So this was our aerator. Uh, we um, grew out of stormwater, started doing wastewater. And on one of our first projects, a uh, big wastewater project, actually, it was it was very, very big. Uh, we worked with an engineer uh, who liked Triple Point, liked the technology, uh, liked to see like in general what we were doing. Um, but as a part of his specifications, he said, you need to get something called ASCE testing. Specifications had other stuff too, like you must put this many SCFM of air in and hit this pressure. Um, you must be able to operate under these conditions. We said, yes, we can do that. We can do that. We can do that. We saw this, this, this term, ASCE testing. And ASCE stands for uh, American Society of Civil Engineers. And ASE testing, uh, had, they have a standard for clean water auction transfer. Uh, so we, we did our research. We looked, we looked into it and said, yeah, yeah, we can do that. Uh, we have fine bubbles, right? We're fine bubbles. Everyone knows fine bubbles are the most efficient technology out there. They get at least 2% per foot. Uh, you know, we, we, we said to ourselves, and we were very cautious, and, I, and I'll, I'll kind of tell you about that in a little bit. Um, but we said, you know what? we're going to derate our performance because just in case we're a little bit wrong, we, we, we toned down our, our commitments. We said, we, will, we won't do 2% per foot. We'll do 1.9% per foot. We thought we we're giving ourselves a T-ball. So we would love to show you, Mr. Engineer, how efficient we are and how we can meet your, your standards. So we went about it. Um, uh, well, actually, a bit more about this facility. This facility is one of the bigger lagoons in the country, and I'll show you a photo of that in a, in a little bit. Um, they used to have surface aeration, and uh, I think there's one, two, three, there's eight surface aerators on the top of this pond, and they were really big. They were like 100 or 150 horsepower splasher units. Um, and unfortunately, this is a Gulf Coast city, and Hurricane Katrina came in right around this time, and all eight of these surface aerators ended up at the top end of the pond. So they viewed this as an opportunity. A, they didn't want any other aerators on the surface of the pond anymore, subject to weather events or hurricanes like Hurricane Katrina. And they also saw it as an opportunity to get something more efficient. Surface aerators are pretty well known to not be, to not be the most efficient uh, type of oxygen or uh, aeration that's out there. Uh, they knew they wanted fine bubble, uh, but they wanted to maintain mixing. And that's why they went with triple point. So we designed a system, you can see it here, uh, it's 288 units based on the criteria that we set of 1.9% per foot efficiency. Um, and we went down this journey, we said, yes, we will get ASC testing. Um, another important thing to, to note here is, I consider morality, morality to be pretty important to me. Um, and I think it's just as important uh, to our company. We're a very principled organization. Uh, we always put, uh, our relationships and our products above profit. We don't want to sell snake oil. Um, a long, you know, many moons ago, I was involved uh, in a job where I was asked to do to sell what I now realize was snake oil, and that didn't make me feel good. We never wanted to do that again. At Triple Point, it's important. We don't sell snake oil. We do what we say we're going to do. Um, again, we we try to be well-intentioned individuals as best as we can. Um, and that's how we went into this. We thought we were going to accomplish what the engineer wanted. And on top of that, we've done our research. You know, we've read Metcalf and Eddie. We know what aeration curves look like. We know how fine bubble tends to react. The more air you put through it, the less efficient it gets. Uh, we've re researched all sorts of fine bubble out there. Uh, we actually got data directly from different manufacturers and we use that in our system. So we, we, we said, 
okay, we know how much air is going to the fine bubble. Uh, we know how much air is going to the coarse bubble, our aerator. Um, and based on the curves that we get from various manufacturers, and when we derate it just a little bit, uh, we can expect uh, X, Y, and Z performance. And as you can see here, we chart, this is one of many examples. The data here is not specific, but if you look, you know, we've, we've calculated some of these SAEs or standard um, aeration efficiencies down to nine decimal points. <laughs> Anything calculated to nine decimal points is, is, has to be accurate, right? Um, I think you'll find out that's not true. And off we went. Went on USA Blue Book, bought some of our uh, diffusers here, and uh, went to testing. So in our research, we had found that there is one independent lab uh, set up, ready to go in the country, or oh, there was, this was back in 2009, um, where you can get independent testing or ASC testing. Essentially, you have a couple of smart engineers right here. You have Mike Hicks. Uh, I'm not sure if he's a, he's a PE or a PhD, but he, de he definitely lives and breathes aeration. Um, they have a tank set up. They, they pump in clean water uh, from you know the, the just the regular potable water system, and they have all sorts of uh, oxygen transfer probes on the inside, and they have pumps to pump in slurries of chemicals that you'll learn about a little bit later in the presentation. Uh, and they have lots of sensors on blowers and, and other pieces of equipment. So we know exactly what's going on inside of this tank. So off we went. We have an aerator here. It's being lifted up. It's a, maybe a 30 foot tall tank. Uh, 20 or 22 feet in diameter, uh, lower it down into the tank and strap it down and start testing. Turn the air on and fill the water up. So again, we're looking for around 1.9% per foot. So based on the depth that we were requested to test for, we uh, were aiming for 15% total. So uh, that's maybe uh, eight and a half feet of total depth at 1.9% per foot. We're looking for 15%. We can absolutely do that. Heck, I think we're going to do 16. I think we're going to do better because we have fine bubble. We're the most efficient out there, right? Um, we go through, get the testing, and you get a whole bunch of variables. You scan through it, and you know, especially early, early on, I didn't quite know what I was looking at, but it looked scientific and it looked right. Uh, but then you get a bit lower, and you'll see these numbers, 8.3 and 1.15. And took a little bit of time for it to dawn on me is that that 8.3 is what we were hoping would be 15. This was the efficiency that we were actually getting. And you know, despite all the research and all the effort and, and hours and hours, dozens of hours of engineering time put into this, uh, well-intentioned, we thought we were doing the right thing and using as much science as possible. This was what we were getting. And we didn't know that until we shoved it in a tank and tested it on an independent basis. And there was actually a photo of me that was taken uh, in the tank. And I don't know, if, I'm pretty sure this is not when I found out the data, but the look at my face pretty, pretty well uh, encompasses how I felt at the time. Wide-eyed, scared. Uh, this is your, your not so fearless narrator here on this webinar. Um, it was a pretty scary time. We had made a commitment to a community that we were gonna deliver a certain level of oxygen and we are finding out that we, at least with this current permutation of the aerator, we were unable to hit that. Um, and it was terrifying. Uh, we got this data in the morning and I know uh, a colleague and I found that out and drove down the road silently, sat down at Red Robin and had a burger, probably a beer, and we didn't talk the whole time. And in our heads, we're thinking to ourselves, what are we gonna do? I mean, we're not even on the same planet of where we need to be to fulfill our commitment. You know, we, we have on our wall, we say it, we do it. How are we going to we say it, we do it on this one? Um, and, you know, deep in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, like, should I dust off my resume? What's next? Uh, you know, I've, I've royally screwed the pooch on this one. And, um, you know, we decided, you know what, we're going to figure this out. You know, we need to learn more. Let's, let's, let's go down this path. So we're realizing that our product doesn't work. We were in the position of selling snake oil and we didn't want to do that. And we weren't able to say what we were going to do. And we clearly uh, were getting good data, but we did not make good decisions ahead of time. So what's next? Well, this lab was run by Jerry Shell. Uh, Jerry Shell is one of the, or was one of the three pioneers of the ASCE clean water testing method. Uh, it's Jerry Shell, uh, David Redman and Michael Stenstrom. Um, Jerry Shell unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago, 
Um, and it's actually been kind of a fun trip down memory lane here, making this webinar, going back and looking at the videos and whatnot. Uh, um, so sad to see that he's going, but uh, it's fun that we can watch him. And we can attribute a lot of our, you know, a lot of growth uh, to Jerry Shell. We went back to the drawing board and we said, okay, what are we doing wrong, Jerry? You know, tell, teach me about aeration. What do we not understand? And Jerry Shell sat down and gave us an education um, for about four hours straight. And it, it, we'll say it's a bit of tough love. Uh, there might have been the words like, <laughs> you, you know, you guys are being idiots if you came in here and didn't didn't know what you were getting into. This testing was expensive when we were a small company. I think we were paying around twenty thousand dollars at the time, and uh, we did not know what we were going to get. So we sat down, and he gave us that education. He told us he taught us about the different efficiencies of different membranes and the materials and the types of um, uh, tube uh, tube diffusers and disc diffusers and ceramic diffusers. Um, and we went down the path of saying, okay. Well, how do we design or change our aerator, keep the concept, but change our aerator to give it the best chance of, of hitting that 15% per foot efficiency? Um, so we went back uh, to the drawing board, went back to uh, outside of Chicago, Illinois, uh, and got to work. And we redesigned our aerator to make it more efficient. We used more efficient membranes uh, that are higher capacity, so we could push more air through them more efficiently. Um, we use tubes, you can see them here, 10 tubes instead of eight discs, because we learned, and I'll show you later what's happening with the aerator, but we learned that getting the air farther away from the center of our aerator was going to yield more efficiency. Um, and uh, we got together, or we, we recalibrated. So there's me again, uh, very, very close to uh, getting my, my nose in the water as I'm trapping down some aerators uh, for testing. This was the updated design at the time in 2009 and crossed our fingers and said, let's go, let's do it. What are, what are we gonna get? Um, so we did a whole bunch more testing and this is just one sample of it. We did three days worth of testing and this is what we got. We're looking for 15% per foot. We got 15.52 or 1.94% per foot. And that is 0.04% per foot more than we needed. So that's exactly what we wanted. Um, we ended up getting our ASCE transfer verification. Uh, it's a report and it says this was the triple point system at this airflow rate at this depth it will produce these results and there's Jerry Shell's stamp right there uh, and he says you're good to go this is exactly what you needed uh, but don't ever do this again uh, make sure you know what you're doing moving forward and we vowed we vowed to do that we realize there's a lot out there that we don't know and we're not gonna stick our heads in the sand uh, we need to know it's part of good data good decisions so this is the eventual installation, 288 uh, Mars units. They still maintain the mixing component in the center. They just had fine bubble tubes in a uh, kind of a antenna pattern. Um, and we installed them and this has been operating swimmingly for about 10 years now. Uh, as I said, this is one of the larger lagoons in the country, this is seven MGD. Um, and you know, we realized the big picture here is we thought we knew what our efficiency was. I think we're decent people and I think a lot of people um, would believe that and say so as well. We had the best of intentions and we wanted to help the town upgrade their facility. Uh, and we're thinking we're gonna save them so much on energy, we're gonna save them from having aerators on the surface. Um, and yet we were inadvertently considering installing an aerator device that in the real world was barely more efficient than those surface aerators we were going to replace. And I guess the question is what saved it, right? Like what saved it was an engineer knowing the importance of clean water testing. He was a stickler for it, and it wasn't a big ask. Just, he basically said, prove what you say you're going to do. And I don't want it to be you proving it in a backyard pool or in whatever lab you have at your factory. I want you to prove it independently. And he was a stickler for it, and that required us, Triple Point, to prove our worthiness to him, our worthiness to have a seat at the table, to have an opportunity to participate in this project. And he, this engineer, ensured the long-term success of the project. Um, and this experience really, really stuck out for us, and it was pivotal in the, for, in the formative years of the company. And um, this is why we always, always recommend uh, clean water testing, and we, we always espouse the importance of it. So let's get into the agenda here of the webinar. Uh, we've, already, um, uh, we've already established what clean water testing is. I'll do a bit of an introduction to the company, that's not why you're here, but I'll tell you a little bit about Triple Point and what we believe. Um, 
We'll talk about why OTE testing is important, more than that story I just told. Uh, and I'll talk about the actual methodology for treatment. We'll talk about treatment challenges, the limitations of the test, and how it can be sometimes manipulated uh, by unscrupulous vendors. And we'll get to uh, Q&A at the end. Uh, and there's me over here. Um, that is me at the bottom of an 8,500 gallon uh, tank that we use. I think it's 10 feet in diameter, maybe 15 feet tall uh, for, our, for some more recent uh, ASC testing. Uh, I've got my light there, so I say, let me be your guide. But <laughs> now I look at it, um, it looks like I'm kind of a troll beckoning you under a bridge. Uh, so that's not intended. Um, but yeah, this is uh, Brady, 10 years older, and uh, maybe 10 pounds heavier, probably more. But I have a lot more experience. So let's 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 get going. Let's do it better. If you know Triple Point, you've seen this around. And if you're getting our emails, you probably know what it means. But I'll explain uh, what I think it means. And it's a belief that we have as, at Triple Point. And it's kind of a silly phrase, but I think lagoons are the best wastewater treatment option for small town America. They are robust, they're reliable, the infrastructure is likely already there, uh, and they're very, very forgiving and easy to operate. You go out, you say, yes, the aerators are on, you do your tests once a week, once a month, and you say, yes, it's performing as I expected. And as an operator, they can go and do the 45 other things they have to do in a day. Um, it's just a very, very straightforward, inexpensive way of treat, treating wastewater for small towns. Um, and we also believe that lagoons can do it better. They were designed 10, 20, 30, 50 years ago to treat BOD and TSS, but they weren't designed for ammonia. They weren't designed for algae. Well, not algae. They weren't designed for phosphorus. Um, and our, our belief is that lagoons can do it better. Uh, they just need to be designed to do that. So our goal is to help lagoons treat wastewater as well or better than an activated sludge plant. And we believe that you can do that in your small town wastewater lagoon uh, with proper design. Um, Triple Point in general is a lagoon process supplier. So pretty much anything, including and after headworks and before disinfection, uh, from a process standpoint, we wanna get involved. So we have different kinds of aeration uh, to treat BOD in your wastewater. We have a cold weather lagoon ammonia removal process where we can remove ammonia in about eight hours down to not detecting your lagoon, no matter what the temperature is. We can also deal with nitrates with our nitrox plus D. And lastly, another big thing that we do is phosphorus removal. Um, but everything in between, we also participate in. We provide baffles, blowers, liners, uh, you name it. And actually, if we don't, if we don't provide it, we can tell you where to go. We just want to help. Um, so that's triple point. Um, as a part of Actually, this webinar is a part of this. We're trying to build a community of like-minded individuals, of operators, of engineers, people who believe that lagoons can do it better. Um, so we have informational blogs that we put out every couple of weeks. We do educational videos. This is a webinar uh, that's a part of that. We put on training events around the country. Uh, I think the last one we did was in Cabela's uh, out uh, in the Pacific Northwest. We bring in uh, an independent lagoon operations expert to do a one or two day seminar. We have a Facebook community where people can come and ask, why is my pond purple uh, or milky white? And what do I do with this kind of algae or how do I get rid of these geese? Um, and you know, operators can help operators on our Facebook page. And if people go and sign up to these different aspects, uh, we give away free stuff. We have little squishy poop emojis. Uh, we have uh, the, these camo hats. If you go to tpenv.com, slash LDIB and sign up. Maybe you just want to be a part of the blogs or maybe you want a squishy poop emoji. Uh, so just go there, find out what you need to do and uh, I guess come on and join us. So let's get back to it. So we know what clean water OTE testing is. So why, why do we do it? Why is it important? And I think it's important to different people for different reasons. So engineers want, uh, want to demand uh, clean water Oxygen transfer testing because they want to have confidence in the process design efficacy. They want to know if I design with this surface aerator or this drop in diffuser that I'm able to accomplish the effluent goals that I want. If we go and spend $3 million at a town to upgrade their wastewater facility and they're not hitting their 30 30 BOD TSS limit, that's a problem. And knowing how much oxygen goes out there is critical to that. Um, it also allows engineers to accurately compare technologies. When an engineer is thinking, well, I could go with a more inexpensive surface aerator that's a little bit less efficient, uh, or I can go with a little bit more expensive diffused aeration system. Uh, it's expensive up front, but the operating cost is much lower. 
being able to compare those two technologies, apples to apples, or even to compare two diffuser technologies or two service aerators, aerator technologies, apples to apples is critical. Um, and getting independent data on that is, is important. Uh, from an operator standpoint, they obviously want to make sure that a facility works. Um, if they are, if they have effluent BOD of 47 and they need 30, you know, it's it's, it's their butt. You know, they they're the ones signing the DMRs and they need to ensure performance. And if it's not working the way they expect, they need to re raise a red flag. They look like they're not doing their job very well. So it's important for operators to know that if I put this device in, it's just going to work. Um, and operators tend to also be interested in operation operating costs. So we're doing oxygen transfer efficiency tests. Um, so that's a combination of how efficient is this at the air going from inside the bubble to outside the bubble or smashing the air and the water together, but also how efficient is the device the, that produces the bubbles? How much energy does it use? The less energy that the device uses, the lower the operating costs for that wastewater facility. Um, and a lot of manufacturers have an interest in this as well. Um, we obviously want to do what we say we're going to do. Uh, we want to deliver what the customer needs, and I want to have confidence in that. I don't want to sell snake oil. Um, I also want to improve a product. You know, over time, you might think, you know, I can make this more efficient or more robust, and you can do theory on a napkin all day long, but until you get it in the tank and test it, you don't absolutely know. Um, and lastly, you can also use clean water testing to evaluate the performance of competitors. You know, where do I fit into the ecosystem here? Am I the most efficient? Am I the least efficient? Um, and that's just important for manufacturers to know. So from a process design, you know, why are we OTE testing? Let's just take, uh, I'm just going to make it up. It's your lagoon, any state, USA, I guess, except for Hawaii or Florida, because there's pretty much no lagoons there. Um, we'll say it has a BOD loading of 1,500 pounds a day. So it's a decent sized lagoon. Maybe it's removing 98% of the BOD. Uh, and at an auction transfer, or at an auction loading rate of one, this is pretty straightforward, Matt Caffinetti, 1.5 pounds of auction added for a pound of BOD removed, we would need 2,205 pounds of oxygen. So we know to get the treatment that we want on a kind of napkin scale, that's how much oxygen we need. And then we say, well, in order to get that oxygen, we have to put a device in wastewater, um, and we know that in the, how it works in clean water versus wastewater is different. So we need to look at what is FTE or field transfer efficiency. Essentially, this is derating the performance of an aerator to account for the many variables in a wastewater facility. So you have alpha factor, which uh, accounts for surfactants, you know, building up on a, on a bubble, preventing oxygen transfer. Maybe it's an oil film preventing the air from getting into the water. Uh, you have theta, um, which is a total dissolved solids concentration, um, how much TDS is in the water and how is that imp impacting transfer. You have beta, oh, I'm sorry, beta is uh, TDS, theta is temperature. Um, you account for how much DO is in the water. There's a lot of variables we account for. And we say, when we put this device out there, how much oxygen are we gonna get? But what's interesting is most of these values are pretty well set. They're pretty well standardized. Alpha for surface aerators is always gonna be somewhere between 0.85 and 0.9, sometimes more. Um, theta is it almost always 1.024, rarely deviates from that. And if it does, it's by a thousandth of a, a decimal point. Um, beta is pretty well set. All of these things are not very variable, except for this one right here. SOTE, or standard oxygen transfer rate. Uh, this is, you know, we're doing OTE testing up here. Um, and standard, it's essentially the same thing. So. The accurate, how accurate the number that goes in right here. aerator standpoint you use SAE standard aeration efficiency how much horsepower do we need to put out here to accomplish what we want to accomplish um, and an error in the SOTE value if triple points telling you we're gonna get 15% per foot and we go in there and we're 10% off that means you're gonna have a 10% error in the final wastewater treatment design so 
That means this is essentially the equivalent of not accounting for 150 pounds of BOD every single day. So this is why getting an accurate, verified SOTE is important because if they're wrong just a little bit, um, your system's not gonna work the way it was intended or at all. So here's kind of a real world case of what happens when you under aerate a wastewater facility. So this is a facility at Triple Points worked with in Michigan. Um, doesn't quite look like a lagoon. Uh, that's because it is covered in sludge. Uh, this has, I think it was 50 horsepower uh, of surface aerators out on the surface of the water. It was a sludge holding lagoon next to an oxidation ditch. And the surface aerators weren't, for whatever reason, putting in enough oxygen. It may have been poorly designed. I don't know its history. I just know it wasn't getting enough oxygen. And what happened was, the sludge started breaking down anaerobically, and, and then it started releasing gases, methane, hydrogen sulfide, a number of gases uh, that get entrained or caught in the sludge, and the sludge popped up to the surface. Then that got thicker and thicker and actually pulled the surface aerators out. So they were under aerating to begin with, and then were not aerating at all eventually. So they wanted to do something different. They wanted all the aeration to be at the bottom. So when the weather, weather warmed up, we installed some Mars aerators. And to give you a sense of how bad this facility got because it was under aerated, this guy is not actually in the water. He is rowing through sludge. And this, this aerator right here, that's 194 pounds or so. We drop it in with a crane and that's how it sat. Did not go through. Uh, we actually had to get a 300 or 600 pound manhole ring and punch through the sludge just to create holes to get the aerators in. So we actually put in an equivalent amount of aeration. So if they had 50 horsepower, we put in 50 horsepower of diffused aeration. Um, diffused aeration is about twice as efficient as surface aerators. So we ended up putting in twice the oxygen that they were. Um, as you can see here, it's very well mixed. Um, and the DO is always two to four milligrams a liter. Uh, this lagoon used to stink to high heaven. I mean, people a mile away were calling and complaining about it. But when we keep enough DO in the water of two to four, it wasn't stinking at all. You could stand right next to it and it smells just like any old lagoon that you, you walk by. Um, it just shows the importance of properly aerating. And when you're under aerated, it can cause very, very severe problems. Another important reason for OTE testing is the fact that aeration is pretty much the number one cost for a wastewater facility, especially wastewater lagoons. You got lighting, pumping, if you have a building, you maybe have a, a heater that keeps the room you know, at 50 degrees. You have a DeWalt drill plugged in, but most of what the power goes to is aeration. You have service aerators out in the pond, you have a blower producing air for a diffused aeration system. So if we're designing a new aeration system or upgrading, if I'm, if I'm saying I wanna be more efficient, if I'm gonna pick an area of this pie to be more efficient, I'm gonna pick the biggest one because that means I can make the biggest impact. So aeration is the primary cost driver here um, and more efficient technologies can help us to save money. So we're here uh, back at your lagoon, any state USA. Say you have a 15 year old, 150 horsepower surface aeration system. Starting to break down, you're getting tired of rewinding the motors, maybe one sunk. Um, and you want, you said, okay, I want more efficient technologies, I want fine bubble. Um, so if that 150 horsepower of surface aeration is getting the job done, so fine bubble systems can come in for around 75 or 80 horsepower. Um, and for this is an annual energy savings of 75 horsepower or $49,000 a year at 10 cents a kilowatt hour. So the more efficient a technology you're putting into a wastewater facility, uh, the more money you can save. So this is the other reason that OTE tests are important, is you want somebody to verify, yes, this is what I'm going to do, this is what I'm going to accomplish, and I will save you money to make that investment worthwhile. Um, and one thing that I've been asked to do before, so I'll just put it out here now, uh, is how I, how I very kind of back of the napkin calculate power savings. So essentially, I just take brake horsepower saved uh, times 0.746, which is the approximate kilowatt usage of a horsepower of a standard motor uh, times 24 for 24 hours a day times 365 for 365 days in a year times the cost per kilowatt hour. In this case, I used 0.1, and that's where I got the 49,000. Um, I had also mentioned that it's important for manufacturer R&D. Um, so this is important in new product development or troubleshooting an aerator, and we actually 
this ASC testing helped us to understand a phenomenon that was happening with our aerator. So if you look here, this is our newer aerator, but it's got a cool design. So it gives you uh, a sense of a phenomenon I'm hoping to explain. You can see here the air is released, but it doesn't go straight up. It kind of collapses in on itself and the aeration column collapses. And Jerry Shell taught us that this happens with essentially any diffused aeration system. And the more collapsing you get, the more the bubbles come together and coalesce, or they form bigger bubbles. And that means you're gonna transfer less oxygen to the water. Um, and you can see it here, here's some, some more CFD. You got all these little arrows pointing to where the water's moving. And if you come over the aerator, you see, as we're sucking up water and propelling it upwards, we're actually pulling water from the outside in. And that water movement pushes on the bubble column and helps to coalesce some. So when we look at this aerator, uh, and maybe, maybe you've already kind of figured out why it happens, it's because we're releasing all of the air in a really small platform. Um, this is not very wide. This is maybe three and a half feet in diameter. And our current aerator is up to eight or nine feet in diameter. Um, so we're releasing all the air in a small area. So it's already very centralized. And we're essentially magnifying the coalescing of this system. Um, what's interesting is this is a mixing and aeration device. Um, but because we we're coalescing so much, it mixed like crazy. It almost mixed too well. Um, what we found is we need to get the diffusers far away from the center of the of the unit, center far away from the course bubble and far away from the kind of overall center of the aerator because we're spreading that air out. And we've learned uh, that we're actually doing that even more on our upcoming aeration device here, spreading the air out as far as possible so every bubble can rise as straight up as it can, not coalesce together. Um, you can you can also use ASC testing to test insulation variables. So we have lagoons, for example, that have been around for a long time and maybe the bottom isn't perfectly flat. What happens if I drop an aerator in and it lands on a cinder block or a rock? Um, we were able to, to go in and with ASC testing, evaluate the importance of this. Um, and we found out that small variation in uh, height or, or you know, if the diffusers are six inches apart or 12 inches apart, this edge to edge, it doesn't affect OTE that much. We actually derate the aerator more than that that uh, that height gives it. Um, and it takes it gets to the point where you have to put the aerator on a slope to really really heavily negatively impact uh, the efficiency of the aerator. But before we ASC tested this, it was all conjecture. You know, it was it was what we thought and what we believed, not what reality was. So ASC testing allowed us to figure that out and confidently answer uh, these questions that customers are, are asking. Um, we've also used ASC testing to hone in on the ratio of coarse bubble mixing and fine bubble aeration on our unit to figure out what's the most efficient while maintaining good mixing. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we can also use ASC testing to compare our devices to those of other companies. Um, we can test aerators um, or you know even even membranes. We can test different membranes on our on our aerator in the same tank with the same blower same water same testing methodology everything we remove every variable and it's just head to head apples to apples what does aerator b do against aerator c uh, or what does you know membrane a do against membrane c uh, another important thing to talk about is the wastewater lagoon landscape and you know you've got maybe 10 10 15 established process providers out there that are quite reliable that you know might do things a little bit differently, but all kind of see somewhat eye to eye. They have ASC testing, they have a proven process, dozens of insulation, so they can back their chat. They can do what they say they're gonna do. And Triple Point falls into this category right now, and I've got this fancy smart guy with a clipboard next to what appears to be an MBBR, this is not my photo. Um, but this is not most of wastewater lagoon uh, technology providers. Um, you've got hundreds of crazy inventors. You know, I feel like every day we see a different technology that crops up and they claim that they have the best widget in the world. And you know, never mind the laws of physics, just trust me. You know, a lot of things are made in garages, you know, on somebody who's kind of a just does it on the weekend, but will claim it's the most advanced technology in the world. You've got lots of lagoon miracle workers that'll say, basically whatever your problem is, our device solves that. And if it doesn't, just buy more. Um, and lots of USA Blue Book Warriors, naive upstarts. I mean, Triple Point fell into this category. A long time ago, we were in this category and until we were forced, um, thankfully forced into actually knowing what our aeration efficiency was, uh, we couldn't leave this category. Um, and we were able to grow out of it because of that. Um, 
So if you don't know the truth, you can kind of believe whatever you want. And that's kind of what we've got is this, this field of, <laughs> of, of aeration manufacturers. You've got your stalwarts and your trustworthy ones. Um, they're not shown here, but you've got all these companies that are just shoving their head in the sand, either because they don't want to know or they don't realize they have to know how efficient their technology is, but they'll claim it's the most efficient thing in the world. Um, I guess some good questions to ask for these other facilities is, you know, or other manufacturers is, do you have independent, independent testing and or if your device is as efficient as you claim it is, if you say it's the best mixer or the best auction transfer efficiency in the world, why are you selling it to lagoons? You know, why are you not going to Stickney in Chicago or New York City? Because if you know, if you could save just five percent on energy at one of those places, you would be a savior, right? So the biggest value would be there, uh, but they don't go there because what they're somewhat preying on is a lack of sophistication in the lagoon space. So you've got operators, for example, that might only see one aeration upgrade over the course of their career. It's once every 15 or 20 years. So they're not experts in this. You know, they're, they're experts in you know, how to clean or how to install a lift station or how to you know, take apart this pump and put it back together in two hours. Um, or how do I get my effluent algae? Uh, to, <laughs> how do I not get algae in my effluent? Um, they're not experts in the ASCE method of auction transfer, and they, they simply can't be. And the same kind of goes with engineers. And, you know, if you go to AECOM or CH2M Hill or Jacobs that are working with um, big, big wastewater facilities like Chicago, Stickney, um, very hotly contested uh, contracts, there are people in, that, in those organizations that have been doing aeration and nothing but aeration engineering for 20, 30 years. They are experts. And those organizations are so big and the stakes are so high that that's all they do. Um, but then you go to, you know, kind of your, your, your more small community engineer in anywhere in America. These are the ones that we work with and they have to be experts at everything. They need to be experts at curbs and, and bridges and, and, and uh, water towers and pump stations and hydraulics and, um, it's impossible to be an expert in every one of those things. So I think a lot of these small town manufacturers are taking advantage of that. Where they come in, they might be charismatic with, with hot, lofty claims, um, and they hope that you don't ask that question. You know, where's your independent testing? So there are multiple kinds of ASC testing, and kind of I lumped them into two categories here. Uh, you've got self-administered, who essentially you have a company doing testing on their own. You know, they have tweaked uh, a knob on their aerator and they want to see how does this impact treatment. Uh, actually, lots of manufacturers have their own test facilities, especially the big, big ones. I hear Sanitaires is by far the kind of, uh, uh, I guess, the standard, the gold standard. Um, and it's a way to test out all the variables and be as accurate as possible. Um, other companies will set up their own test site and do testing at various times in their history. The downside to this is it's unverified. These manufacturers are making their own claims. So if you remember back maybe, I don't know, maybe it was five years ago when a company, maybe you've heard of them, uh, car company VW uh, was bringing diesels to America and they're making claims that diesels are gonna blow gasoline or petrol uh, engines out of the water. We're getting efficiencies of 40, 45 uh, miles per gallon on diesel. Very, very efficient, probably even better the smaller the car gets. And they sold a heck of a lot of them. Uh, I know actually the guy that sits in the office next to me, he bought one. Um, sounded cool, it was a nice Jetta. Um, and, then, <laughs> then, and then they got caught. Um, VW got caught misrepresenting their efficiency. And you know who caught them? Was a little independent lab in you know, some small town in West Virginia. Uh, they were given a random government grant just to do some testing. There was no intent uh, that I'm aware of of the testing. And they and they found out hey, these aren't as efficient as, as as we thought. And then, yeah, they're definitely not efficient. And they and they tried to remove as many variables as they could. And they realized essentially, VW and Audi were cooking the books. They were misrepresenting. This is why self-administered testing is not reliable. It's unverified. Um, as an alternative, you have independent testing. And for all the reasons we've talked about, um, this is the best way to go. If you're an engineer, or you're an operator, and saying, prove it to me. And that's because. You've got this guy right here. He's independent. He is an expert. This is all he does, and he has no agenda. He doesn't care if the aerator works well. He doesn't care how it looks. He doesn't care how much you sell it for. Um, he just, actually, maybe he does have an agenda, and his agenda is the truth. I just want to know what the truth is. So this is Dave Redman. 
uh, he's one he's one of the two um, experts that are out there right now after after Jerry Shell's passing. Uh, we've worked quite a bit with Dave. Dave's a great guy. Um, and then there's there's also scale. Uh, what scale are we testing at? Um, there's kind of lab scale. You can see it here. Um, so we have these videos here, and I think they might not be coming in as smoothly uh, on your end, but from what I understand, they are still watchable. Um, so we've got lab scale, essentially, you, or component scale. Um, this is where a manufacturer will put one diffuser or one small component of a device in a very isolated tank to figure out what is its performance. They might only test it at four or five feet deep um, under very, very ideal conditions. Uh, and then you have full scale. You can see it down here where we've got an aerator. This is a full aerator. We're not just testing one of the tubes. We're testing the entire device. And the more full scale you test, the more accurate you get. You get because you're evaluating the interplay of these two diffusers together, um, the currents from this side affecting diffusers here, as well as the influence of the core simple diffuser. And so how we do testing is we use the ASCE method. It stands for the um, uh, American Society of Civil Engineer Clean Water Oxygen Transfer Method. Um, you can actually, you can buy it here, or you can buy the method here. Uh, this is the, I guess, the code. Um, and the steps are pretty straightforward. Essentially, you aerate a, a given body of water to be tested. You aerate the saturation. That means you get the oxygen as high as it physically can go. Uh, then you strip all of the oxygen from the water. You take it from maybe a 10 DO down to zero DO. Um, with the aerator, you want to evaluate still running. And then you measure the water as it's re-aerated. How long does it take to get from zero DO back to saturation again? And then you control and adjust for a variety of variables. Uh, so here's a setup that we used. Um, and this is obviously more of like a PNID kind of layout. We have blower, surge tank, bleed valve, a number of uh, flow control devices, so orifice plates and, and valves. Uh, we have rotimeters for flow. I'll, I'll get to these in a second. The bit, we have a big apparatus to provide air, and this allows us to know how hot the air is, how much air we have going into the tank. The air goes down to our aerator, the bottom of the tank, with a known volume of water. And then we have a series of three DO meters, and the bigger the tank, the more DO meters are used. Um, we've been in a, in a variety of ASC testing, and I've seen anywhere from two DO meters um, because one broke up to four or six, I believe. Um, and these are put in at various heights, just in case this volume of water stratifies, so there's different layers of, of DO uh, in, in there, we can actually evaluate that. An average of the DO here is taken. Um, unless you have a really, really, really big tank, these all tend to read pretty in line with one another. Uh, here's on the inside of the tank. Again, it's a 15 foot tall tank or so. This is uh, uh, one of our brave guys. This is Alex uh, down there making sure it's installed properly. And after this is installed, he's going to climb out and he is going to fill this up to the desired water depth. So the next step there is you aerate the saturation. Again, when you, you can know based on the temperature and I believe the barometric pressure what the theoretical limit of DO uh, in the water is. So we know what it is here in this case, maybe it's 10 milligrams a liter. Once we know it's there, you, I think they have to maintain that level for uh, 10 or 20 minutes to know it's thoroughly mixed and, and um, uh, saturated. And then cobalt is added and that's mixed for another 20 minutes or so. Cobalt chloride is a catalyst that helps the next chemical to drop the DO out of the water. And then we add this right here, and this is sodium sulfite. This is added in a pretty decent qu uh, quantity. If the chloride catalyst is, or cobalt catalyst is added maybe in a handful, um, this is added in a, in a small bucket or maybe 20 ounces or so, a pound and a half. Um, this is what's gonna suck all the oxygen out of the water. And then we measure, we measure the re-aeration rate. So this is Dave Redman. Um, he tends to do a lot of the work to make sure it's done properly because adding too much sodium sulfate can be, can negatively, actually positively impact the test. Um, so he wants to control everything and make sure it's done independently. I think you scroll down here and you see the bag of technical grade or lab grade sodium sulfate. Um, and then this, uh, sorry about the noise. Uh, so this, you actually see 9.7, 9.5, 9.2. This is right when the sulfate was added. 
and you, you can see the DO dropping like a rock. We're already at 7.8, 7.3, and this is how fast the DO drops when, once we add the catalyst and add the sodium sulfite. You see this is going to drop down to zero pretty quick. We're already at uh, below four. You get the concept. So this is what the DO probes tend to read. Uh, it's a very, very slow process. You have to, again, you have to aerate from essentially zero back up to saturation, depending on how much air you're putting in a tank. Uh, this can take anywhere from 20 minutes to an hour. If you're doing bigger, bigger tanks, it could be six, 10, 12 hours to get all the data that you need. What's pretty interesting is you can see right here, it was at saturation. That's when the sodium was added, dropped like a rock. And the amount of sodium that's added is calculated to be too much. So what they do is they add too much and that holds the DO at essentially a zero or very low value for extended period of time. And there's a standard that says, I think this has to be like two or three minutes to actually fit the ASE test to make sure we put enough in and that we drop the DO low enough. And as the sodium sulfite tends to, or starts to burn off, that's right here when DO starts to accumulate in the water again. And it's easier to add DO into low DO water. So the rate of aeration is actually higher to begin with. And then as the DO increases, you essentially approach a limit and that limit is saturation. Um, now, as a part of this process, you want to record and or standardize different site conditions. So uh, we have volume, you want to know how much water is in there. You want to record water temperature because that means that in, impacts how fast the DO gets in there. You want to record humidity and TDS. That's very, very important. It's also critical to test how much air is going in. If you don't know how much air is going in, you're not going to know how efficient it is. Um, so this is, uh, we have rotimeters here. Um, we have an orifice plate here where we measure the differential pressure across an orifice. We have a mass flow meter. We want to know how much air is going in. And we also want to know the temperature because the hotter the air is, the more expanded the gas is. The more expanded the gas is, uh, the higher it's going, to, it's going to look like from a volumetric standpoint, the higher the flow is going to look like. So we actually have to adjust for the pressure and the temperature of the air to make sure that's standardized uh, technology to technology. Um, after all the data is collected, there's a lot of math that's done. I'm not going to get into details on that here. Uh, if you have any questions on this math, please shoot me an email or ask them here. We will answer them. Um, I'm just not the smart guy. I can tell you how to do it. Uh, I was okay in calculus, but not great enough to sit here and talk to you about it. Uh, so then you get your results. You get a report cover. You get a stamp that says, yes, this was done by ASC standards. Um, and you get a whole bunch of data. Um, I have a, you know, hundreds of pages of data and curves and whatnot that we're not going to talk about. But you see all your runs. You have an airflow rate of... Um, here we go, 45, 33, 33, 23. You want to test a variety of airflow rates to figure out what your efficiency is across all of these. Um, and then you get your SOTE. Um, and based on what you adjust it against, um, it'll, it's, it'll be a little bit different, but we'll see down here the red ones. SOTE of 2.1, 2.2, up to 2.4% per foot uh, efficiency. So this is on our new Aries unit, uh, a little bit over nine foot of depth. Um, the output number is a little bit different depending on the technology that you use. Um, SAE down here tends to be uh, used more for surface aerators and it's expressed in pounds of oxygen transferred per horsepower of the motor per hour. Um, and this is used because horsepower and oxygen transfer are intimately wed in surface aerators. You can't separate them. Uh, from a diffused aeration standpoint, it's a little bit different. Um, the, the efficiency is uh, dependent on how deep you put it. The more depth you have, the more time the bubble has to rise to the water column and transfer oxygen. It's more efficient the deeper you go. Um, and also, you have a blower that sits on shore. And this blower is pretty agnostic to the system. You know, it could be a low efficiency, cheap kind of roots package blower, or it could be a premium efficiency turbo blower. And how efficient that is will impact the costs on the system. But when we're comparing diffusers, we only want to compare this because we want to isolate all the variables and look at just one device. Um, so for diffusers, you, the SOTE uh, is a standard oxygen transfer efficiency is uh, expressed in percent of efficiency per foot of submergence. So here's a quick video. Um, this is Jerry Shell again, uh, talking about the efficiency of different systems. Primary reason, savings of energy. 
on the uh, the high speed surface aerator does about two pounds of oxygen per horsepower. The low speed does about three pounds of oxygen per horsepower. A good uh, diffused aeration system will do seven to eight pounds of oxygen per hour. That's a, an enormous jump in, in, in efficiency, which attracts the market. Mm -hmm. So the long-term benefits from diffused air are obvious mm -hmm. with cost, just for energy. Uh, so these are values uh, from GSEE, the lab that Jerry Shell ran. Uh, and he's tested thousands of surface aerators, not thousands, probably thousands of different devices, hundreds of surface aerators, hundreds of fine bubble diffusers, and they all fall into these categories. Okay, I can't get rid of this. They fall into these categories. Uh, fine bubble membranes, uh, of which the MARS is primarily fine bubble, is going to achieve in a standard aeration efficiency of four to seven pounds of oxygen per horsepower per hour. Usually a well-designed system is more like five to seven plus. Um, that test that I showed you with our Aries unit, I believe that was calculated at 7.5 or eight pounds of oxygen per horsepower per hour. Coarse bubble will fall in between two and three pounds of oxygen per horsepower per hour. And surface aerators will be between, between 1.5 and 2.25. There we go. Uh, and here's Jerry Shell again, kind of discussing market trends well, there's applications for all types of aeration equipment. That's why they're in the marketplace today. But if 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 efficiency, long-term and short-term efficiency is the goal, then there's only one direction to go, and that's to to uh, find bubble uh, membrane or ceramic diffusion. So from an efficiency standpoint, uh, well, everything he's seen is, shows that fine bubble is the most efficient technology verified on the market. Granted, that was back in 2009, um, but this is the opinion of, of uh, Jerry Shell. Um, there are some limitations to ASC testing. Uh, as I mentioned, it's very time consuming and expensive, and there is some variability to it. Uh, Dave Redman taught me this, where essentially you can take the same aerator, it's the same water, same tank, same everything, test it today for 20 minutes and then test it tomorrow for 20 minutes. And there will probably be as much as 5% variability test to test. Um, and this is just by nature of what the test is. Um, and you can't always pinpoint what that is. So you, you have to take many tests and take an average of the results. Um, I've seen variability as much as 15 plus percent. Um, the other thing is that they're not directly applicable to the lagoon environment. You're testing in a tank. You're testing in a uh, small tank, big tank, massive tank. It's a limit, right? There are walls to the tank. It is not 100% the same as a lagoon. A lagoon might have a clay bottom. The tank has a um, cement bottom. So it's not directly uh, applicable. What happens is the smaller the environment, um, the, the better the testing gets. Because the smaller the tank is, the more turbulence you get in the tank. Um, and that's why, so you saw our, our diffuser numbers there at 2.4% per foot. We're never going to design, design that in a wastewater lagoon. The device can do that. When you put it out in a wastewater lagoon, it is subject to other variables, and we won't design, usually we design at 1.8, 1.9, 2, maybe 2.1% 2 uh, per, per foot. But we don't want to push the limit because we know um, that a tank is different than a wastewater lagoon. So it's important that manufacturers know that. Um, the ASC test doesn't account for field conditions, so there's a lot of fouling, uh, de residual DO considerations. There's a lot of things that affect the OTE out in a lagoon, and that's why you uh, go and derate it to produce the FTE, or field transfer efficiency. So clean water oxygen transfer testing will not tell you those things. And clean water oxygen transfer testing is also a best case scenario, right? It is every manufacturer trying to put their best foot forward. Just like, you know, when honest car companies go out and do their their uh, NPG testing, you know, they're making sure their tires are pumped up and they do it at higher altitudes, and they do it on well-paved roads um, to get the best possible case. Nobody wants to put their worst case forward. So just know that when you're looking at OTE testing, you are looking at the best case scenario. Fortunately, in especially wastewater lagoon design, you're derating the aerator for uh, alpha factor and a number of other factors. Uh, you're, you're saying, I want to design the system to have the you know, what is, what is the efficiency at the hot, hottest temperature, the highest loading, the worst case scenario across the board. Uh, so there's a lot of conservatism already built in, uh, but just know that 
all manufacturers are testing the best case scenario. They're not going to show you, you know, the worst. Uh, there's also some challenges that we had. I know I'm running a little bit long, so I will uh, blast through these here. Um, but there's water source limitations. Essentially, you know, we had water that was coming in really, really cold out of Lake Michigan, and this is in December and, and April. Um, and when we had to adjust an aerator, um, you know, as you can see here, we had air leaks at one point. We had to adjust an aerator. This is Alex here, our freeless Al Alex had to get in and dive down and, and make a quick adjustment. The water was so cold, he needed a wetsuit. So I admire his, his adventurousness. Um, also, the TDS of the water source matters. So the ASC tests will let you test up to a TDS of 2,000 milligrams per liter. Um, uh, but if we have water, at one point we got well water, that water came in out of the gate at 700 milligrams per liter. And every time you add cobalt and sodium sulfite, you're adding solids to the water. So the water accumulates solids. At a certain point, you have to drain it uh, to uh, get new fresh water in. That takes time. Um, we had quite the hassle with airflow measurement um, here. So we actually had a situation where you know, we had rotimeters and two rotimeters right next to each other, which should be accurate to within 1%, were reading very different values. So we added another rotimeter and all three were reading very different values. So we, re we rebuilt it. We got any leaks out of the system that, that might have been there. We changed the um, bends and, and angles before the rotimeter to, to kind of sanitize the air to make sure we're getting a clean flow, still getting a variable. Then we added a mass flow meter. That's a $2,000 device just to measure how much air is moving. And that measures essentially air particles moving across the filament that cool it down. It's supposed to be extremely accurate. So now we have four devices all reading different numbers. Then we get an orifice plate uh, where you measure, it's a defined hole. We know that as the air moves through this hole, it loses pressure. You just measure the pressure before and after to figure out what your accurate flow is. Um, we now have five devices that are reading very different numbers. And what we found out was that the, the blower was creating harmonics, um, essentially a pressure variability in the system um, where areas of the pipe were higher pressure than other areas uh, and air was essentially leaking by or slipping by these, these, these devices. We had to put, Alex went and got a 55 gallon drum, filled it with egg foam to scrub the air or sanitize the, the pressure fluctuations out of it. And all of a sudden, all of these meters started reading, you know, within a couple percent of each other. Um, little things like this, setting up a test facility takes time, it's difficult. Uh, membranes also need to be conditioned. Um, essentially, when you take them out of the box, they have a, at least a lot of these membranes are extruded or maybe they're molded. They have an oil on them or they have some other chemical, maybe a talc that affects how they perform. Um, some manufacturers will actually put their, their diffusers in wastewater for a period of time to develop a biomass and to get off all that those surfactants and other materials on there to get them in the right condition. As a matter of fact, membranes on day five are going to be more efficient than membranes put in on day one. They actually get more efficient before they start fouling. Um, and part of that's also because you get a little bit of bio um, buildup on there that can make them kind of slick and slippery and it helps the bubbles to release. So getting the membranes conditioned is important. We, we got the, the system installed it on day one and we didn't get good numbers and we didn't know why. And we had to go down this process and learn more. We learned from Jerry Shell a long time ago and the next time around we learn a lot from Dave Revin. It took us three months to get this, this set up right so we know that we're getting accurate numbers. Uh, and then uh, getting towards the end here, lastly, the ASC method is not incorruptible. It can be gamed. Um, we got Lady, maybe it's Lady Liberty there, I'm not sure. Um, but she uh, is obviously independent. She doesn't know what's going on, but somebody can come on the outside and tip the scales a little bit. Um, if it's not independent, it's always, it, it can obviously be motivated by an agenda. But one of the big ones is TDS manipulation. Uh, lots of uh, people don't understand that the higher the TDS, the higher the performance results. Now the ASC standard, the new standard, I'm not sure it's actually even been released yet. The new standard requires a normalization or a, an adjustment uh, factor be applied to normalize the TDS to 1,000 milligrams a liter. Some manufacturers don't do that. If you look at their data, ask what TDS it was taken at. The higher the TDS, the higher the performance. A lot of manufacturers, they would say, oh, well, we can test to 
uh, 2,000 milligrams a liter. So they would artificially raise the TDS in their tank to 2,000 milligrams a liter, do the test, and always keep it there to give themselves the best possible result within the scope of the test. Um, other manufacturers might raise the TDS to 3,000 or more. Um, and if you don't know what you're looking at or it's not independently verified, uh, that might give you incorrect results. Um, other manufacturers might test an unrealistic scale. They might test one diffuser in a baby little tank. I'll give you kind of the worst case scenario. I won't tell you uh, the manufacturer, but I know there's a manufacturer out there claiming extremely high oxygen transfer rates, um, 3% per foot or more uh, for fine bubble, which is pretty unrealistic. And they did their tests um, not in a 8,000 gallon tank. Um, they did the test in a six inch pipe. Uh, this pipe is maybe 15 feet tall, and they didn't put, if I give you an example, that last diffuser you saw of the Aries, our product in the tank, every one of those diffusers has 20,000 slits, it's 10 of them plus the coarse bubble. So you got 200,001 200, orifices through which we're pumping air up to 56 uh, standard cubic feet of air per minute. This manufacturer put in 16 slits. So 200,000 versus 16, um, and not 56 SCFM, in this tank, they put in 0 0.04 SCFM, which is not representative of anything in the real world whatsoever, but they got great results because the tank was so small and so controlled, the airflow was so low that the efficiency was great. It just doesn't mean anything. It's not reliable and it's not something that should be counted on for aeration design. So if you can ask, you know, say, show me what your test setup looks like. You know, are they testing an entire device? Is it representative? What's your TDS? Um, and if manufacturers are comparing uh, uh, their equipment to each other, uh, they, the tests might not be set up as fairly as possible. As I said, it took us three months to make sure that we were doing our tests right. You know, if a manufacturer goes in and tests their competitor, are they really gonna spend three months to, to make sure it's done right? If they get the data they're looking for, they get bad data, they're gonna stick with it. Um, so uh, you kind of have to take uh, data from competitors on competitors with a bit of a grain of salt. Um, so wrapping up here, um, I'm about eight minutes over, and I appreciate those of you that are sticking with me. Uh, seems like most of you are, and I appreciate that. Um, so here uh, are some independent testing resources. These are the, the surviving kind of fathers of aeration. Um, both do independent testing. You've got Dave Redman with Redman Engineering out of Wisconsin. Uh, his contact information is up there. I've done a lot of work with him. And I've talked uh, a few times with, with Mr. Stenstrom, Michael Stenstrom out of Los Angeles, California. Uh, he's actually a professor at UCLA, but will do independently verified uh, testing if you bring him to your facility. Um, and here we are, we've got some key takeaways, um, just as a recap. So clean water testing is absolutely essential to making sure your system is designed properly and to allow you to evaluate the performance of one aeration system versus that of another aeration system. Um, and the most important kind of verification you want is independent verification and independent ver verification with the ASCE methodology. Essentially, you wanna look for an engineer that stamped it and signed it. Um, this means that they looked at this and this is, this is to their knowledge and their understanding factually accurate. So you wanna trust but verify. And then at the same time, take all results with a grain of salt. Um, clean water testing is only as reliable as the company or individual that produced it. Um, so I believe there's a mechanism by which um, you can ask questions here. I don't know if I have any, check it out on your screen, um, but please ask any if you do. And um, you also have an opportunity of emailing me directly. Um, my email is there on the screen. I've got braden.oleary at tpenv.com, or you're welcome to give me a call. Uh, anything you send to me or to the uh, webinars, uh, the person who set it up, uh, her name is Eve Bjork. You probably got some emails from her. Please feel free to send her questions as well, and we'll make sure to get those answered. So looking here. Okay, so I am not seeing any questions. Hopefully I'll take that as uh, this was a very comprehensive webinar. Uh, okay, so 
Uh, thanks for sticking with me. This has been a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun putting it together. I'm glad uh, you were able to participate in it. Um, again, please shoot me any questions, uh, or if you have just Lagoon questions in general, reach out to anybody at Triple Point. We'll love to help. Um, thanks again for coming, and we'll see you next time.